Welcome to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast. Each week, we interview the best and brightest in physical therapy, wellness, and entrepreneurship. We give you cutting-edge information you need to live your best life, healthy, wealthy, and smart. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Karen Litzy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I am your host, Karen Litzy, and today's episode is brought to you by NetHealth. NetHealth wants to help you maintain strong relationships with your patients, especially during this time. So they have the Redoc Patient Portal, which provides a secure line of communication between you and your patients. You can conduct video conferencing for telehealth, secure messaging, share documents and photos, view health information and appointments. Your patients have 24-7 secure on-demand access to their therapy health information without phone calls and voice messages. And the patient portal is included with the Redoc license. However, video conferencing is available. Please contact NetHealth at Redoc at NetHealth.com. So big thanks to NetHealth for sponsoring today's episode. And Jenna Cantor is back in this episode, and she is interviewing Dr. Andrew Ball. He is a board-certified orthopedic physical therapist with nearly 20 years of experience in physical therapy. Drew has earned numerous advanced degrees, including an MBA, PhD in healthcare management, and post-professional DPT from MGH Institute of Health Professions. He has completed a postgraduate fellowship in leadership education and neurodevelopmental disabilities at University of Rochester and a postdoctoral clinical residency in orthopedic physical therapy at Carolina's Rehabilitation in Charlotte, North Carolina. Clinically, Drew has mastered a wide range of manipulative therapy techniques and approaches via continuing education and residency experiences. He is certified by the National Academy of Sports Medicine as a sports performance enhancement specialist and was personally trained and certified by Janet Travell's physical therapist protege in myopain seminars in myofascial trigger point dry needling. Dr. Ball serves on the Specialist Academy of Content Experts, uh, or SACE, writing clinical questions for the OCS exam, as well as research and evidence-based questions for all physical therapist board exams. So what do they talk about today? In this episode, Jenna and Drew talk about the pathophysiology of COVID-19, physical therapy treatment considerations in acute and outpatient settings, post-traumatic stress disorder among patients and family members, and functional tests appropriate for patients following COVID-19 infection. So if you are a physical therapist and you are going to be seeing patients recovering from COVID, this is the episode you want to listen to. So thank you to Jenna and thank you to Drew and everyone enjoy. Hello, hello, hello. This is Jenna Cantor with Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart. I'm super excited because I have Dr. Andrew Ball here who is going to be interviewed on COVID-19. Has anyone heard of it? Anyone? Bueller, Bueller. And return to performance post-infection. This is such an important conversation. I'm really excited and grateful to have you on, Dr. Ball. Thank you. Well, first of all, please call me Drew. And second of all, let me thank you and uh, your listeners for having me on. Um, Wonderful. Um, it's, yeah. it's really a joy. Would you mind telling people a little bit more about yourself so they can bet, better get acquainted with Mr. Drew? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I uh, have been doing physical therapy for, I have a 20 year history in physical therapy. Uh, I've taught for a good majority of that time. Uh, I started out in pediatrics doing what I was told was the first fellowship in pediatric physical therapy and neurodevelopment uh, at uh, the University of Rochester, which has since kind of turned into a uh, uh, APTA accredited residency uh, uh, program at uh, uh, the Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities, and then evolved into doing orthopedics. Uh, I hold an MBA PhD in healthcare management. I went and did a post-professional DPT, but I gotta say none of that matters. Really, the, the salient point, um, and I think I'm using that word correctly. Um, but like the, per- the word, though. Go with it. Go with it. <laughs> the pertinent point <laughs> is that I could be any one of your listeners 
who, tr who treats in outpatient orthopedics, who treats in sports. Um, my uh, passion is working with musical athletes. Um, I started working with guitarists. I played piano at Peabody when I was a little kid. Uh, put that down and uh, uh, and uh, ultimately, I got back into music by playing guitar, by being forced to play guitar uh, because I was working with guitarists. And at some point, it's like working with a football player and never having played football or treating dancers and never having danced. There's a, there's, a, there's a point where there's a level of respect from your patients that you just don't have unless you actually have, have done the work. You can't really speak the language. So I recognized that there were two ways, one of two ways to do that. One was to begin building guitars, so I started doing that. Um, and then ultimately, one of the guys that I uh, built a guitar for who, uh, plays guitar for Carl Palmer, uh, formerly of Emerson Lake and Palmer in Asia. Um, basically, he told me, like, this guitar is great, but you really have to learn how to, how to play. Or, yeah, yeah I mean, you, you really are going to have to learn the language of the little things, like the posture and the whole, you can talk about holding the guitar. But, you know, if you're, if you're a grunge player and you're playing bass, you got to play that guitar, and you got to play that bass guitar at your name. And it doesn't matter because um, it doesn't look cool to have it in the right, you know, proper position. And the muscle memory that, that these guys have been and gals have been uh, doing, you know, since they were, uh, you know, 12 years old, uh, you know, you're not going to change that. It's like changing someone's golf swing. Or if you're going to change it, they have to understand that it is going to be for a greater good, like being able to play a 60 date tour versus having shoulder pain after, after, uh, after 30. So, so, um, so I kind of weaved and waggled, um, through, uh, trigger point dry needling. Um, and I, uh, also teach for, for my pain seminars, but that got me into, uh, working with the Jamaican Olympic track and field team. It got me into working with the Charlotte, uh, symphony and I'm one of the physical therapists for them. Um, but ultimately, I am just like any one of your performance PTs who uh, is interested in that population and at the same time truly, truly wants to help individuals that have a hard time finding care. Um, and to that yeah. point, yeah. is that that's correct? Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, uh, uh, you could go on for, for, for a very long time, and I really want to get yeah. to the point, because this man, clearly, he is a person to learn from. He has so much information to share. And I'm really happy about this topic that we're diving into with COVID-19. Let's go straight into the point. COVID-19, what are the effects that it has on the body that we need to start paying attention to? Like, like the first things that we have to just acknowledge, because this is going to be something new to us to consider. Right. So let, there, there's a lot of things that we need to consider. Um, the physical, uh, I'll talk about first, um, and the psychological, which mm. is a piece that we don't, mm. that certainly performance, that's a huge issue, but that's certainly not something that most PTs uh, outside of the performance training group really, really focuses on. So uh, I'll start out with a, uh, a friend of mine who was one of the first uh, thousand people uh, to be diagnosed with uh, with COVID. Oh, wow. um, she uh, was in uh, Washington State. She was one of the first 250. She's super super bright. Uh, she's a uh, has a PH, holds a PhD in aerospace engineering or aerospace uh, engineering design. And does she's she know a, Aerosmith, or is that not related? I don't think she does. But I okay, do just a good question. Great. I needed to ask it. Yeah, yeah. No, continue. Yeah. She's um, a little bit younger than I am. I'm, uh, how old am I? Not quite 48 uh, years of, of, of age. And she was, is um, extremely fit, um, uh, very outdoorsy, uh, plays an instrument. Um, so I just want to kind of walk through what she experienced. And this could be, again, any one of your listeners. Um, on, on day zero, we'll call it, before she was diagnosed, um, she was um, uh, 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 skiing. 
uh, I believe snowboarding, but skiing and uh, had some aches and a dry cough and, and fatigue and experienced something that she had never experienced before uh, that she described as chest awareness. Now, your patients and folks that you work with are very acutely aware of breath, right? So I kind of asked her, was that what you meant? She's like, no, I felt like I had to consciously think about every inhalation and exhalation that I took. And that was before, before a diagnosis, but that was faint, she described it as. On day one, which is the day that uh, the fever tends to rise, not everybody has a fever, so there's variability right, uh, right. here. Um, that She spiked a fever of 102, she had difficulty breathing. Day two, that, that worsened, she had a, a dry cough, and we should get into the idea of a dry cough versus a wet uh, cough a little bit later when we talk about the physiology of this and how it differs from uh, pneumonia. Um, and had some uh, GI uh, uh, dysfunction uh, as well. And although we kind of talk about the upper respiratory issues, we also need to understand that uh, the virus uh, enters through the <coughs> angiotensin, the, um, the, the angiotensin converting enzyme two uh, receptors. And there are, there's obviously the majority of those are um, or in the lungs, but there are some in the GI tract as well. Um, they're actually all over the body, but um, uh, and that's why some of the lesser talked about uh, symptoms include things like GI disturbance and uh, urinary uh, issues, uh, and in her case, um, loose bowels. Um, by day three, that's when she had a, a virtual visit, and. Luckily, because there were so few folks being diagnosed at that time, she was able to get a clinical diagnosis by that evening. Now, you know, wow. We think of COVID. By day four, that's when she went to the emergency department because she felt like she thought she had a pneumothorax. She felt like she was unable to fill her left lung with, uh, with, with air. And they, they did a chest x-ray. They did the nasal swab. That was day four. She described it as touching her brain. I mean, they, it's, it's, it's a significant swap. You have to go all the way up to the back of the throat in order Ooh, to get that's give people that right, which oh. is why many folks who feel like they have a mild case, when they hear that, they choose not to uh, engage the healthcare system. And I, I really think that's a bad, 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 bad decision uh, because Yes, 80% of folks are going to have a mild to moderate case, but those 20% uh, that, are, that, that you carry it to can have a severe uh, reaction to the, to, the, to the virus that can be, that can be fatal in far too many. Right. Um, day five through nine, her fever uh, uh, began to break uh, roughly day, day seven. She had a reflexive, excuse me, cough. She was unable to sleep. She felt like her ears were completely clogged. She was coughing up blood and coughing so much that she had uh, conjunctive, like conjunctivitis, like that redness in the, uh, in the eyes. Day nine was what she described as noteworthy and described that as intense exhaustion to the point where she had trouble lifting a spoon. She had trouble uh, zipping up a, a, a jacket. And it wasn't until day 11 that she felt like having uh, any kind of food or any kind of coffee. Now, here's the critical point is performers are super, super attuned to the idea of, I felt bad. Um, the show must go on. I've got to push it. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, and, and roughly day 11 through day 14, that's when the viral load is decreasing, but the inflammation is increasing. That's when people go on to ventilators. That's when people kick into this cytokine storm that we've, that we've heard of. And it's, it's critical to understand that uh, as a healthcare provider and certainly as a patient or, or performer, because there have been a number of cases where people had mild cases and they pushed themselves during this phase a little bit too soon 
and died having very having had very very mild symptoms and then and then uh took a, a turn uh as of day 14 she still had some difficulty concentrating uh she was still exhausted she found it exhausting to uh to 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 speak um and still had a morning um sore throat and that's considered a mild case you know, so I think that's that's important to understand where these people have have come from. Um, you know, we we don't need, well we can get into the idea of ventilation um, and, and whatnot, but before we do, it probably makes a little bit more sense uh, to get into uh, this kind of case and how we would treat yeah. them coming out of this when they can have contact and we can help yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so kind of jumping forward into uh, well, let's take a step back before we do that, if you don't, if you don't mind, just into the pathophysiology a little bit, or would you like to jump back and forth? Let's, if we do the pathophysiology, just because I don't want this podcast to be too long, let's yeah. make it very brief, sure. very, very brief, so that way we can move forward. That'd be perfect. Yeah, so I think it's important to understand uh, that uh, COVID-19 is not influenza, it's not cystic fibrosis, it's not pneumonia. And those are the diseases that when you took cardiopulmonary physical therapy, like that was the primary focus, was these diseases where the airways would fill with mucus. That is not at all what happens in COVID-19. So it, a percentage of folks get acute respiratory distress syndrome, and it's a dry cough. And the reason that it's a dry cough is that the airways don't fill with mucus. What's happening is that the uh, capillaries begin to leak fluid into the lung tissue itself. So mm. think of it like lymphedema of the lung, which sounds horrible, right? Yeah. So the, the airways are getting, a couple of things are happening. The airways are getting squozen, but air can still get kind of in and out. But the elasticity of the lungs is going to decrease considerably, right? And Which is why she felt like she had pneumothorax. Exactly. So you were saying that there's the there the lungs have lost their elasticity. There's much more fluid within the lungs, like not yeah. in the lungs, but yeah. on the like lining. So if you think of the lining, thank you. If you think of the lining like a balloon and having that kind of uh, the alveoli having that kind of consistency normally, it's as though you took Vaseline and you just slathered the balloon. Uh, with Vaseline, and then expect for the gas to exchange at the same rate in between in between that that membrane, and it just and doesn't to breathe harder thinking of this and that right. feeling. Yeah. Exactly. So the problem is not mucus. The problem is ventilation and perfusion. So part of the reason why I got very interested in this is uh, I there is a role, obviously for quarantine workouts. And by that, I don't mean, you know, our brave soldiers within our profession that are in acute care and in the ICU and are turning patients so they don't get bed sores and turning them uh, into prone for optimal ventilation perfusion. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the therapists that the only thing that they're posting is uh, information on what healthy people can do when they're stuck at home. And I, I, there's a place for that, sure. But I really feel like there is a, a, a role and a responsibility that our profession has to educate the public and to educate each other about COVID-19 and, and little things. So, uh, so I started out just asking questions about what can we, what can we as physical therapists do, right? You know, I went back to my cardiopulmonary books you know, what is the role of putting people into a head down uh, position, that, that postural drainage, so they can get the mucus out? Well, newsflash, they don't have mucus, right? So that's not going to help. And it's not the best position for, ven for ventilation uh, perfusion. So that's, that's important. Um, and the other thing I started asking was, well, what about chest PT? You know, I was awesome at chest PT. I haven't done it since graduation, but I remember that as well. Um, the problem with that, again, no mucus to clear. The only thing that you are going to do if you are trying to help uh, a performer with a mild case 
who is getting over COVID-19 is you will weaponize and aerosol the virus. So, I, you know, there were several folks that were suggesting that based on a poor understanding of the physiology. And uh, now we really have to retool and get the information out that, no, the best position for somebody who has an active case of COVID-19 is prone because that optimizes ventilation perfusion because of fluid dynamics and the anatomy of where the, uh, where the alveoli uh, are. So I think that's important to understand because in performance, you know, we fast forwarding, we like to think about things like posture, right? Posture may, I mean, it can't hurt, but it's not going to make the huge effect that we think of uh, with some of the other respiratory structural kinds of, of problems. Kinesio taping can be somewhat helpful for folks who have breathing dis dysfunction. And until folks get very, very, very far in their recovery process, that's probably not going to be helpful. When I talk about prone, these folks have been placed in a prone position for uh, the minimum protocol I've seen is 12 hours. But usually it's somewhere between 16 and 18 hours a day in a 24-hour period to optimize ventilation perfusion. Oh, wow. Different right. kind of head source. Right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Well, the other issue, uh, getting into the psychology of all this, oh. is uh, 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 isolation psychosis, delirium. And these are people who are in pain and have a hard time taking a breath. Right. They can't they can't have family members come visit. They them. can't have family members in there. Right. So what do you think the impact of that is going to be when you see the patient six to eight weeks after the resolution of symptoms in outpatient or as a performance based therapist? Yeah. It's going to be probable in uh, uh, more than 50 percent of cases, 54 percent of cases. It's going to have a huge mental health impact that you can see uh, at least 12 months later as PTSD. Now, I don't know about you and the, the musicians or performers that you've worked with, but um, myself included, I don't think that we're the, the least dramatic bunch. And you layer post-traumatic stress atop that. And what you end up with, if you don't understand that walking into the room with the patient when you do the evaluation or when you, when you treat them, is a whole group of individuals, half these folks, who are going to have behavioral reactions to everything from the frustrations of making their appointments down to frustrations with the treatment process. It's just going to blow up seemingly out of nowhere. And I'm here to tell you it's not out of nowhere. So when you're talking uh, about the psychological component, mm -hmm. oh, it's such an untapped th situation. This is all so new to us. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I guess it would just, I, I mean, off the top of my head, which is how I am with my people when I'm with them, is just really checking in, just checking in, asking. I would just keep asking and being like, are you okay? Let me know if this is starting to freak you out in any way. I think that's, that's the, gonna be the, the big thing. Like, I need you to feel comfortable. I need you to feel safe and has to just be that level of, I mean, which we always have anyway, but a, a new level of thought process that, you know, a sensitivity where something like going even prone could make them go, <gasps> you know, yeah. and, and they don't even know. They don't even realize they're doing it, but their whole body could just even just naturally tense up. And it could just become harder to breathe just because they develop a new habit to feel like that's what it's going to feel like when they're on their stomach. We don't know. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, there's a ton of research on working with patients with, with uh, post-traumatic stress as a function of, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to get political here, but as a function of uh, endless military action that mm -hmm. our country had over the course of the past umpteen uh, years. So there's a fair amount of information on that, but I, uh, awareness uh, is, is, is going to be critical in, in, working, with, uh, in working with these patients. Um, going back to infection, though, 
Um, the question that I get asked probably more often than anything else is when is it appropriate to begin working with these folks without personal protective gear? And on that note, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor and be right back with that answer. This episode is brought to you by NetHealth, helping you maintain strong relationships with your patients. The Redoc Patient Portal provides a secure line of communication between you and your patients. Conduct virtual visits and have follow-up conversations with your patients via secure messaging when it's convenient for you. Patients have 24-7 secure, on-demand access to their therapy health information without phone calls and voice messages. Video conferencing for telehealth, secure messaging, share documents and photos, and view health information and appointments. To learn more, contact them at redoc at nethealth.com. Um, and the answer to that is we, there's some guidelines from the European Rehabilitation uh, Society, but we, we, we really don't know. What we know is that patients can go stealth and can be contagious long after their symptoms disappear. And there's at least one case study, um, a well-written case study, showing that the symptoms, that the patient can shed the virus for 37 days after they're no longer symptomatic. And the problem with that is that here in the United States, testing is scarce, right? To diagnose it, to say nothing of, of when, when are you clear completely of the, of the virus, I'm not aware of widespread secondary testing. And there, some of the guidelines from like the, the World Health Organization um, suggest that someone needs to be tested, I think it was in China, um, needs to be tested twice and have a negative result twice before they're cleared. So the guidelines are six to eight weeks and that's, that's why, because you're gonna be long, long past what we, what we know to be. Uh, the the longest reported case now whether or not your 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 patient is that you know new new one uh, uh that can uh where they stick around shedding the virus for 42 days or 48 days you know we don't know and uh one of the scarier things uh from a public health perspective uh for me is is the recognition that this is an rna virus which means that it's going to be harder to create a vaccine because uh, like the common cold, like the rhinovirus, um, it slips, it mutates quickly. Now, fortunately, that has not happened, um, but there is every reason to be worried, uh, and I don't want to freak people out, but there's every reason to be concerned that if we don't kill this thing this year, that it's going to come back every year in a slightly different form, perhaps more contagious, perhaps more stealth, perhaps more deadly. Um, uh, perhaps it'll, it, will, it will shed the virus for a longer period of time uh, before we're able to begin working with, with, uh, with, with patients, which kind of gets to that economic uh, effect. I understand that people are hurting. I understand that uh, that folks have private practices and cash-based practices that that have uh, a limited cash flow, and they're they're hurting. I totally understand that. Yeah, it's you know, very sensitive. Felt, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I you know, and folks go, oh, you don't understand. You you know, Drew, you 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 know, work for uh, 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 a a. It doesn't matter, but you know, you you work in a situation where you don't own your own practice. Yeah. And while that's, while that's true, um, you know, I, I have a significant impact, uh, uh, income from teaching. So, uh, you know, I get it. I understand you know, that the dollars are, are tight, but if you told me that if we shut down for an additional two weeks and we can kill this thing completely, I, I would, I would do that. Even if that meant a significant decrease in my salary. And at some point, I think that as a, and I'm not saying that everyone is a clinical doctor in our profession. I've gotten some some feedback for that. But as a clinical doctoring profession, I do think that we have a solemn responsibility 
to the public in terms of educating on COVID-19 versus kind of uh, uh, filling the Instagram space with uh, lots of, of home workouts, which are important. People need to uh, uh, keep fit um, and certainly keep their minds going while they're in, while they're in quarantine. Um, the problem is that there's so many outpatient private practice cash-based PTs that have a, such a voice on Instagram that some of this information about just the mechanics of the disease, uh, the physiology of the disease, how long you need to wait in order to uh, protect yourself and your patient from uh, either reinfection uh, or infecting uh, others just isn't pushing through. So once again, thank you for allowing me to come on this podcast because I, I, I do think that those of us who have a voice in that space have an obligation to get some of this information out. Yeah, yeah, it really, it's, it is, it is very valuable. I want to actually dive in, even though we've been going for a while, I, I think it is important to dive into now somebody who had the yeah. ventilator. Yeah. I think that, that we can't, we can't overlook that. There will be some people who've been that unfortunate. So okay. could you talk about that different, what that means with somebody yeah. who has been fortunate to recover from such a horrific, um, uh, um, uh, sure. response so, to this. So as I so said, about, about 80% of patients, uh, are going to have a mild to moderate case right. and, and they won't be hospitalized. They may, because of the stress and strain on their lungs, they may develop pneumonia. So they may actually end up, you know, having secondary sputum. Um, but those are folks who, even with the pneumonia, are going to have something that we consider a, a fairly mild, mild case. 20% are going to be severe to critical. And the severe group are the ones who are going to have dyspnea. They're the ones who are going to have rapid breathing that's defined as, as more than 30 per minute. Um, their oxygen uh, saturation is going to drop to 93%. And they'll have uh, on a CAT scan, you'll be able to see lung infiltrate uh, that looks like kind of a grounded uh, glass uh, appearance um, of, um, of about uh, 50%. Uh, so, and, and then you've got 14% that are severe that fit that classification, about 6% that are critical. And that's respiratory failure, septic shock, multi-organ failure. And within that group of uh, 20%. About 25% will end up in the intensive care unit, uh, most of which, um, or many of which, will end up on a ventilator. And if you end up in the ICU uh, on a ventilator, your chance of survival is about 50%. So what tends to happen with that ventilated population is on roughly about day 14, uh, uh, we talked about how the viral load increases and then and then decreases while the inflammation um, increases. Well, as the inflammation in the lung in increases, um, a, a percentage of those folks, as I as I said, will end up roughly around day fifteen, needing to be ventilated for about four four to five days, and half of them will come off and half of them will not. So the people who come off, mm -hmm. their, their, their recovery. So their recovery, um, we, we, we don't, again, there haven't been a ton of folks, so we don't know a ton. What we do know is that in severe uh, cases, there's going to be ICU acquired muscle weakness. They're going to have a severe loss yeah. of lung yeah. function, a severe loss of muscle mass. A that's severe huge, loss of muscle control. Older, it's the older generation primarily too. And Even the younger. younger. Yeah, we're getting younger too, but just as they've been saying, percentages. Yeah. yeah. Uh, neuropathy, uh, myopathy. Um, the, the, the good news is, is that we can begin to predict recovery. And uh, the greatest, what we know is that the greatest amount of change uh, in physical function uh, will be seen uh, 
if the patient falls into acute respiratory failure, we'll see that within roughly the first two months of, of discharge. So that gives us some kind of a gauge. Um, in addition, um, the degree of disability at, at about a week after discharge determines the one year mortality and uh, uh, recovery trajectory that, of that individual. So we have some guidelines as far as that's concerned from acute respiratory distress syndrome, right? So that's not necessarily COVID, but we believe that we can extrapolate and generalize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we haven't talked about is the impact on the family and the fact that about 30% of family members of individuals with acute respiratory syndrome end up with PTSD. So now you have this group where 50% of, of, of folks who have been in the ICU have PTSD, and 30% of those folks have family members who have PTSD. Now, how do you think that's going to go down? Or, like, or, well, a lot of them can't go into the hospital, but they can do a FaceTime video. So what they get to see in that FaceTime video with, it, with their loved ones in the hospital. I'm talking about after they're discharged. Oh. I'm talking, you know, I'm talking oh. to you later. Yeah. No, but I'm just saying the family members with the person, I'm like their interaction. That's what I'm referring to. Sure. Yes. Their, their reaction yeah. with the, their but interaction. That's so with tough if you're prone for 16 to 18 hours a day, yeah. right? Yeah. So what do you do with these folks when you finally see them, right? So you're going to have I give folks them chocolate. That, chocolate makes people happy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's funny. It's funny you say that. I'm I'm uh, I'm doing a webinar with uh, 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 some uh, some other instructors that I that I teach with, and we're kind of talking about the, the the format. And I'm a huge fan of the old school. I love the Daily Show, but I'm a, I'm I'm a huge fan of the old Daily Show with Craig Kilborn. He used yeah, okay. to do the thing where he would like ask opinion questions. Like uh-huh. uh, I'll ask you, uh, Reese's Pieces or M&Ms? Reese's Pieces. No, I'm sorry. The correct answer is M&M's. No, um, no, I'm sorry. You're wrong. No, I would agree, but that's what he would say. So, oh, you know, I love that. Like those, and he would end with those kinds of questions. Kind of, it was like his version of uh, the James Lipton kind of five questions. What do you hope that God says when you die? Anyway, we're getting off track. Yeah, um, yeah. So what I'd like to kind of go through is you're going to have folks that, that have worked with you in the past, uh, they are post-infection. Uh, they're, they are your dancers. They're your musicians in the pit. They're your uh, directors. They're your loved ones that are going to refuse to see anyone but you, right? And of those folks, you're going to need to know what to, you know, what to, what to do. I would say if you hear nothing else from me, remember your vitals. And there has to be a renaissance now of taking heart rate, taking respiratory rate, taking oxygen saturation, taking blood pressure um, with every patient. Uh, The functional tests that we're probably going to have to start using are things like ambulatory distance, which is going to be severely decreased. We'll be lucky if some of these folks are able to walk 300 feet. Some of them, right? If they're severely impaired. Um, You know, that's not far enough to get from your car to a doctor's office. You normally need about 500 feet for that. Um, to say nothing of getting back to your daily life and doing your own grocery shopping, with which you need uh, at a super target or, or, or Walmart, you need you know, a good half mile. You need a good 2,500, 2,500 feet. But things like the, um, the uh, five times sit to stand test or test that we're going to need to brush up on, the, the uh, six minute uh, walk test. Um, fortunately, we can remote monitor some of those things. Telehealth isn't just, uh, you know, getting on a, a Zoom call with somebody. Telehealth, uh, we need to think of that in an in a expanded way, right? Um, there's apps that will allow for you to do a six-minute walk test or your patient to do a six-minute walk test and then, you, and then send you those uh, results remotely from their, from their app. Um, some folks aren't going to be able to walk for six minutes, right? So at that point, we're going to have to back up into uh, feet per second or or meters per second, and we have some 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 metrics for that. 
Uh, you know, we know that somebody who's under 70 uh, at a normal walking pace should be able to walk a good 2,500 feet at uh, 4.0 feet per second. So, if, you know, somebody comes in completely de deconditioned and they're walking 1.5 feet per second for 500 feet, we've got some work to do. Yeah. Surely. Yeah. Surely. Yeah. Um, you know, don't forget about um, deep breathing, deep uh, and I don't just mean, you know, the breath, but I mean the breath. I mean the deep diaphragmatic breathing, bringing it all the way down into your, into your belly. Your performers should be well, well aware for of that. Singers, for those dancers who sing, that's huge. That's right. so huge to reconnect right. with it, even though that may seem so basic with them before, but had they caught the disease and, and uh, for sure to make sure that starts to get all connected and back intact and not a stressful thing to right. do. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I look into things that, um, that uh, as I've spoken with some cardiopulmonary uh, uh, specialists, uh, you know, all of this comes from the European uh, uh, Rehab Society. I also want to plug uh, the American Physical Therapy Association. I should have done this at the very top uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the discussion, but the PACER project, the post-acute uh, COVID-19 exercise and rehabilitation program. It is completely free. But it's, it's, uh, it's time intensive. Um, you know, they've tried to break things down into 45 minute or hour and a half lectures, but there's like eight or 10 of them. Uh, you don't have to watch all of them. It's free. If you want to get the certification in the CEUs, fine, go through the APTA Learning Center. But they put everything up on YouTube and all you have to do is search APTA cardiovascular section and you'll get the, uh, the, um, uh, the literature. I think a lot of uh, OPT. Uh, I, I think a lot of orthopedic sports performance-based PTs. Um, they're really tech savvy, and they kind of want to get the information through podcasts um, or a like a one-hour uh, 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 presentation. So that's essentially what I'm trying to do is to translate. I love it. No, and that's that's what's so great. I mean, I, I'm I'm going to be sharing this in, in groups as well to keep spreading the information, which is which is absolutely wonderful. This is good. Well, I do add in a couple of things that I've kind of brought to their to, to some of their attention. And uh, because they're kind of case study oriented, they're like, well, we're really not teaching that. But particularly for it can't hurt. And particularly for for performers humming, um, and I don't mean like hum, 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 humming a song. I mean a long, deep droning. Hum. There's evidence to suggest that it temporarily increases carbon dioxide, and it tempor temporarily increases nitric oxide, and in so doing, uh, leads to temporary vasodilation. So it can't hurt. I don't know how long it actually lasts. Certainly the deep breathing and increasing walking distance and walking speed is more important. But if you're bored and have nothing else to do while you're in quarantine, uh, humming is probably not going to work. Singers would appreciate that. They'd be like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure, yeah. I, I, that would be a, a vocal way for them to get that all connected. Also connecting nasally. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff with uh, training and staying vocally fit, if you will. Um, so that would actually speak to their uh, values. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the you know, there's I, I could go into a, a lot more here. Um, I just want to make sure that that folks have uh, a good kind of basic understanding here. Um, you know, we have we've heard, you know, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll make a plug for wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. And even in some other countries where uh, the healthcare workers understood the severity of COVID-19, uh, uh, the healthcare workers seemed to be a risk to themselves because they didn't properly and thoroughly and frequently uh, wash, their, wash their hands. Um, so I would, I would say whatever you think you're doing, it's probably not enough. Um, the other thing that I would say about uh, uh, the hand sanitizers that we, that we tend to use, 
um, the World Health Organization and FDA suggest 75 to 80% alcohol. Uh, and that is not what most clinics have. Uh, most have like the, the foam sanitizer or the, like the Purell, which mm -hmm. is 60%. Um, you know, plugging performers, um, a uh, amazing uh, guitarist, my, 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 my performance Buddha and spirit animal is uh, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw who oh uh, is in the band, Sun you know who that is? No, I just love the name, continue. He, he's in uh, Sons of Apollo. He was the lead vocalist for Asia this last tour. And uh, those of you who love Guns N' Roses, uh, he uh, was the guitarist, uh, the main guitarist on uh, the last Guns N' Roses album, Chinese Democracy. Oh, he nice. is ridiculous as a player, and he's amazing as a, uh, uh, as a teacher as well. In any event, he also has a line of hot sauce. And one of the, and I just love when performers do this and kind of take, take responsibility for the position that we're in. But uh, unitedsauces.com, uh, which is the distributor that he works with, has retooled one of their lines to put out hand sanitizer that is uh, 80, uh, 75 to 80% alcohol. So that will in fact kill the coronavirus. So um, great local company here in Charlotte, um, highly, highly recommend uh, and plug and plug them because, hey, you wanna support a, a, a performer, um, Absolutely. You, know, you know, during these, during these, uh, during these times. Um, and the last thing that I wanna leave folks with is, is as you are working with patients post-infection, ask yourself, do you need to put your hands on this patient? Mm -hmm. Can this be done remotely? And I'm really more talking, uh, you know, it, really more talking to the folks who do outpatient work, who have their own side hustle, um, who do work in a, in a healthcare system, who are going to be pulled inpatient, right? Yeah. You know, either somewhere like New York City, where, where, where you are, um, and folks have to be kind of pulled, pulled, pulled in, or, you know, right down to the rural hospital, uh, you know, in the middle of nowhere, and there's two physical therapists, one inpatient, one outpatient, and they need help working because now they have uh, more folks uh, that are getting that are getting ill. Um, you know, really ask the question, both inpatient, in your cash practice, in your private practice, for the sake of killing this thing, and for the sake of uh, decreasing whether or not you're a force vector. Do you need to provide that tra treatment? And is there someone else who can be your hands? Can you delegate that to a nurse? Can you delegate that to a family member? Um, I really think that uh, we're going to, uh, um, uh, a friend of mine uh, who runs another uh, uh, podcast, uh, Adam uh, Meekins, has been talking about physical therapy in terms of ACDC after, uh, during COVID and after COVID. And I really think that all areas of practice are going to change. Um, as a as a result, ranging from the little things that I just talked about, you know, having to do vital signs with with uh, with everybody, uh, right down to really asking the question: Can I go from an interdisciplinary model of care to a transdisciplinary model of care? Can I let go of that of that professional boundary and and ego and I know that a lot of my contemporaries, a lot of our contemporaries are not going to be comfortable with that. I think we have to be secure in the knowledge that we have uh, more than the hands that we place on people. It's, 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 it's all important, but I do think that there's going to be a paradigm shift. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on, Drew. This was an absolute joy. Where can people find you and reach out to you, either on social media or email? 
Um, I, well, um, they can reach out to me. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Dr. Drew PT. Uh, they can email me at uh, Dr. Drew PT at gmail.com. If I don't respond, uh, I have a ton of spam filters. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, don't be shy about reaching out to me through uh, social media. But I, I, I really want to make it clear, I'm not the expert here. Uh, the, the true experts, you know, are people like Steve Tepper, uh, Ellen Hildegrass, um, Angela uh, Abeta Campbell, uh, uh, Talia Pollack. Uh, you know, these are the folks that we really should be taking our, 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 our cues from. Um, and if you really want more information, I'm happy to direct people to it. That, but that is helpful. Yeah, again, absolutely. The PACER project. The post-acute COVID-19 exercise rehabilitation uh, project is really where folks want to go for more in-depth uh, information uh, from physiology to uh, post-acute through the entire spectrum of, of, of post-acute care. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. You guys give a big shout out to him. If you, if you have seen this, uh, just so he can really see how he has impacted so many. Thank you so much for coming on, Drew. Have a great day, everyone. Well, thank you so much to Drew and Jenna for a really great conversation and it was really enlightening for me as an outpatient physical therapist to hear all of that great information that Drew shared. So thank you so much. And of course, thank you to our sponsor, NetHealth. So NetHealth now has the Redoc Patient Portal, which provides a secure line of communication between you and your patients, conduct virtual visits, and have follow-up conversations with your patients via secure messaging when it's convenient for you. Patients have 24-7 secure on-demand access to their therapy, health information, without phone calls or voice messages. To learn more, contact them at redoc, that's R-E-D-O-C, at nethealth.com, or you can hop on over to the podcast website at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com and click on it there. So thank you very much, everyone, and stay healthy, wealthy, and smart. Thank you for listening, and please subscribe to the podcast at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media.